Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Now, you guys know how much I love Audible. I have been using it for years. And this month, I just have to recommend The Woman and Me by Britney Spears. It was so, so good. It's not too long either if you're looking for a quick listen. It's about five and a half hours or so. I went through it in two days and just enjoyed it so much. I did a little book club on it on my podcast, The Sesh, if you want to check it out and hear all my thoughts, but I highly recommend checking it out for yourself. I also have an updated Audible listening list that I will also have listed in the description box if you want to check out some of my upcoming picks. Check out some of my favorite titles from 2023, including some picks from Audible's Best Of collection. And if you want to listen to The Woman in Me or any of my other picks, you can listen for free with a free trial of Audible for new members. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from the entire catalog. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre from bestsellers to new releases, celebrity memoirs, mysteries, thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and more. You can use Audible for free for 30 days when using my link, which is audible.com slash Kendall Ray, or you can text Kendall Ray to 500-500. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to True Crime with Kendall Ray. Thank you for being here today as we discuss yet another case. And if you are new, then welcome. Be sure to click subscribe if you haven't already. So the case that we're going to be getting into today is absolutely wild. And this one comes out of Colorado. It's local to me, so it's one I've wanted to cover for a while. But before I get started with that, I am so excited today to be able to play for you the first trailer for my upcoming documentary, which is coming out in 2023. We have been working on this the entire year, and I'm so, so proud of how it turned out. I cannot wait for you all to see it. So without further ado, let's roll the trailer. So that is going to be coming out, like I said, later in 2023. I'll have an exact date for you all soon, but me and my team are just so pumped. We worked so hard on this, and I'm really excited to see what you all think of it. It's on a case that really needs awareness, absolutely needs justice, and there's a lot of corruption in this case that I'm excited to expose. I will be releasing a few more trailers in the next couple of weeks that are more in depth and give you more an idea of what to expect. So look forward to that. And if you want to see that trailer, I will have a link to it on its own below. But let's go ahead and get into today's case here, guys, because we do have a lot to go over here. We're going to be talking about the murder of Yoon Mi Hoi by her daughter, Isabella Guzman. So let's start on August 27th, 2013. Isabella Guzman got in a fight with her mom and it ended with her spitting in her mother's face. Her mom, Yoon Mi Hoi, was used to her daughter's bad behavior, but this crossed a line that she had never crossed before. She was born in Aurora, Colorado and grew up as an only child. And Isabella is said to have been difficult on her parents, even from a very, very young age. I guess she had a lot of behaviors that made her very difficult to parent, but what exactly these behaviors were, I'm not sure. But what we do know is they were bad enough that when she was seven years old, her mom sent her to live with her dad. Isabel's parents got divorced when she was only three years old. And as a child of divorce myself, I know that no matter what age you are when your parents split, it's going to affect you in some way. But it sounds to me that Whatever these behaviors were, they were unfortunately bad enough that her mom felt like she needed to live full time with her father, at least for a little while. And I wish we knew more about her early years or why her parents were so worried about her behavior, but unfortunately, we just don't. I do know that there were several times where police were called to her house because neighbors thought they saw someone breaking and entering into their home. Turns out it was just Isabel's boyfriend. And to me, that's just, you know, typical teen behavior. And I don't believe that that was the reason that her parents were so concerned. So she lived with her dad for a little while. And then eventually she moved back in with her mom and her stepdad when she was 14. But the problems with Isabella did not stop there. Unfortunately, 
they just got worse. And by August of 2013, when Isabella turned 18, things were so bad that her mom and stepdad had just pretty much reached their breaking point with her. And Isabella's stepfather, Ryan Hoy, said that she became even more threatening and disrespectful towards her mother than ever before. And I mean, quite frankly, Yoon Mi was becoming scared of her own daughter. And that, of course, broke her heart because she loved her daughter and she wanted their relationship to improve. She wanted things to get better, but she just couldn't get through to her. And sadly, Yoon Mi would never be able to repair what little relationship the two of them had. On August 28th, the day after her daughter spit in her face, she opens an email from her daughter and it says, you will pay. And even though this email was addressed to someone named Cecilia, which will make sense to you guys here in a bit, Yunmi was obviously scared that this was a threat to her. With everything that had happened with Isabella recently and the way that she saw things escalating, she decided for her own safety, she needed to contact the police. So she did, and she hoped that the police would be able to talk to her daughter and maybe get things to a better place. Now, given that Isabella was 18, her mom had every right to kick her out of the house. And she didn't want to have to do that, but she wanted her daughter to know that if she continued on acting the way she was, that there would be consequences to her actions. And that's basically what the police told Isabella as well. They said, if you don't start acting right, your mother has every right to kick you out of the house. But they weren't sure if the message was getting through. Isabella was very quiet and didn't react much to the police talking to her. So you and me decided to contact her father, Robert. She knew that the two of them always had a better relationship, and she thought maybe Robert could talk to her, and maybe things would get better after that. And so he tried talking to her, and according to him, he thought the conversation went pretty well. They sat in the backyard, and they talked about respect and how people should treat their parents, and he truly thought he got through to her. But the truth is, by that point, there just was no getting through to her. And hours later, things took a horrible, horrible turn. That night, around 9.30 p.m., you and me came home from work, and she brought back McDonald's for her and her husband, Ryan. She and Ryan talked for a little bit, and at one point, she asked him if he knew where Isabella was, and he said he didn't. And I can only imagine how nervous she was coming home that day, not knowing what Isabella was going to be like, knowing just hours earlier she had called the police on her own daughter, a daughter that she loved and hated fighting with. But like I said, Ryan said that he didn't know where she was and that he hadn't seen her for the last hour. So she tells Ryan she's going to go upstairs and take a quick shower. But within minutes, she was fighting for her life. Not long after she went upstairs, Ryan heard what he described as a series of thumping sounds coming from the bathroom, followed by a blood-curdling scream. And he said that at first, he thought that Isabella was fighting her mom using her fists, and so he went upstairs to try and stop it, but unfortunately, it was just too late. When he first got upstairs, the door to the bathroom was actually slightly open, and shortly after, Isabella pushed herself up against the door and locked it so he wasn't able to get in. So he's just helpless and he's hearing the thumping sounds continuing from the other side of the bathroom door and then blood starts to come out from underneath the door and that really freaks him out. And so as anyone would do, Ryan ran back downstairs and got his phone to call 911. On the phone, he's frantically telling dispatch what's happening and the fact that he's seeing blood come out from underneath the bathroom door. He also explained that this was not their first call to the police that day and that the police had come by the house earlier and talked to Isabella. And then he runs back upstairs hoping that he's somehow able to open the door and save his wife. And that's when he hears his wife's last word, which was Jehovah. And then to his surprise, Isabella just opens the door. She just casually walked out of the bathroom with a blank stare on her face, holding a bloody knife. And then he looks down and sees his wife lying on the floor. Of course, the dispatcher instructs him to start trying CPR, but even he knew that there was just no hope for his wife. Her injuries were so, so bad. Yunmi was dead and Isabella was gone. I saw Isabella, she had a blank expression on her face. I'm not sure what happened with the knife she was carrying. It looked like she was still holding on to it. And I looked down and I saw my wife on the floor, blood everywhere, all over the bathroom. I was talking to the dispatcher and the dispatcher told me, make sure you get her breathing again, get her airways open. I don't know CPR. So, I, but at, at that time I looked at my wife's eyes and I knew that uh, she must not have made it. I just couldn't, couldn't believe that, that it had happened like that. 
Isabella was in a rage like I've never seen before. What do you mean? Well, she, I could just hear her just pummeling my wife. I thought she was just hitting her with her fists. Okay. So that thumping sound you were Thumping hearing. sound, I thought, was you mean maybe hitting against the wall okay. and Isabella just pounding her with her fists. Okay. So that's what I originally thought it was, and that's when I called 911. EMS arrived at the scene at approximately 10.16 p.m., only 11 minutes after the initial 911 call was made. And by 10.28 p.m., Yunmi was officially pronounced dead. And this scene was absolutely brutal. She had been stabbed 79 times, 31 times to the face, 48 times to her neck and torso, and likely several blows from a baseball bat as well, which officers found lying next to her body. And like I said, there was no sign of Isabella there, so police wasted no time starting their search for her. With breaking news in Aurora this morning, police are now looking for this woman. They're calling her a suspect in a deadly stabbing overnight. A woman was found dead in a home on South Lima Street. This is near Parker in Havana. Eric Lufer is live with the details on the investigation. Eric, what's taking place right now? Dale, when we first got here just after 10 o'clock last night, we talked with police. They said they were waiting on a search warrant before they could go inside. When I got here at 4 o'clock this morning, I did see a few officers uh, coming in and out. So it looks like the investigation has started. I'm going to step out real quickly for you, show you what's happening here. This is the house in question. This white house here, you can see the yellow tape blocking off. And they've also got the road blocked off as well. And you can see several squad cars still in the road here. Let's give, a, uh, give you another look at this suspect. Isabella Guzman, 18 years old. This is the woman police are looking for. They were searching for her everywhere last night. They even used the help of a, the Denver police chopper last night. They did a reverse 911 to homes within a one and a half mile radius searching for this woman. Here's what we know so far. Just after 10 o'clock, police got a call on what was supposed to be just a family disturbance. That's what police thought. And they were caught off guard when they arrived. They said a man greeted them at the door and told them that there was a woman upstairs with apparent stab wounds. Police pronounced the woman dead on scene, and then the search was on for Isabella Guzman. Again, she is still on the loose. Police looking for her as we speak. She is named a suspect right now in this case. And, of course, the investigation is still ongoing, still very active here. And, of course, we're going to cover this from start to finish throughout the morning, and I'll be here for it. The police immediately put out a bolo on Isabella, which, if you didn't know, is a be on the lookout. And they told the public that she was armed and dangerous. And of course, they attempted to track her cell phone, but unfortunately, she had turned it off. So it was clear that this manhunt was going to continue through the night. Eventually, they did find her, but it took 16 hours. They ended up finding her in an Aurora parking garage the next day on August 29th around 2 p.m., and she was arrested on suspicion of first-degree murder. And what's crazy is they actually found her because someone had called in saying they saw a dead body in the back of a Jeep, and it was actually Isabella sleeping, and she was covered in her mother's blood. When they got there, though, she wasn't in the Jeep anymore. She was actually just outside the parking garage. They also found the knife and a backpack full of her personal belongings just sitting outside the car. And when she was captured, she was still wearing the same outfit that she murdered her mom in, a pink sports bra with turquoise shorts. They also found a few other clothing items of hers inside of the H Mart bathroom, which surveillance footage captured Isabella going into after fleeing the scene of the murder. And while she was in this H Mart, she had interacted with people who were there shopping and she was covered in blood and none of them called 911. She later said that she had told them all that she had been raped and didn't want to get the police involved and these people just listened to her. But even though her capture and arrest went smoothly, the next several hours of interrogation did not. On August 29th, the same day as her arrest, Isabella spent hours in interrogation, and it went as badly as it possibly could, but probably not for reasons you would think. Because the thing is, Isabella Guzman has schizophrenia, but she didn't know that, and the police didn't know that. So while she's sitting in the interrogation room, she fully believes that she is a 15-year-old girl named Samantha Gonzalez. And the investigators are sitting in that same room fully believing that she is intentionally lying to them. And of course, we know she isn't telling the truth, but you have to keep in mind she is experiencing complete delusion. And in her mind, she really thinks she is Samantha Gonzalez. Now, I'm sure many of you think that she is fully aware of what she did at this point and that she is just 
outright being deceptive and isn't experiencing delusion. But what I will say is the interrogation footage, which I'm about to play, has been reviewed by professionals and is their belief that this is a delusion. However, it does not excuse what she did by any means because what she did is absolutely despicable. But I do believe that knowing that information will help you make sense of the footage I'm about to play for you. You left her to die brutally on a bathroom floor. I did not murder anyone. Please stop accusing me of this. Just tell me how that feels. Please fingerprint me. Please fingerprint me. Please fingerprint me. I will show you that I am not this freaky, horrible person. So she's 110 pounds. That's really skinny. I'm 148 pounds. Isabella, please. Don't call me Isabella. That's That's your name. My name is not Isabella. My name is Samantha. There are people in this world that look alike, you know? Mm -hmm. You guys are not like all-knowing you don't know everything you're just accusing me of all this stuff that i didn't do we know what you we we know what you did and we know who you are we know how it Apparently happened not, it happen. you guys are completely wrong you got the wrong girl no we don't we don't have the wrong girl and you know that no i don't how did it feel how did what feel when you did what you did how did it feel i Make didn't feel kill good? anybody did that's it disgusting did it feel good it's disgusting you guys really think I'm a murderer? Yeah, we're not joking. Did it make you feel powerful? Yeah. Just you. Now, I'm sure you can hear in their voices that the investigators are absolutely not buying her story and that there is a lot of tension and frustration in this room. Isabella keeps repeating that all they need to do is fingerprint her and then they will know the truth. But the truth is that she is Isabella and she did just murder her mother. But at this point, investigators have no idea that she's schizophrenic and they just continue to berate her. And they're hoping that she'll just finally come clean, but it's entirely ineffective. I'm not this girl. I don't know what happened with her and her life and who she is or what school she went to. That's not my problem. My problem right now is finding my boyfriend. It's a funny game you're playing, but nobody's laughing. Do you think think some juror sitting on a jury is going to believe that you're not the person we suspect killed their mother I'm when you're caught right down the street yeah. with knife injuries to your hand? Scissors. It's not scissor injuries. I told you they were scissors. It's not scissor injuries. Yes, it was. You're not going to bully me into admitting what you want me to, like, pretend no, to be No, I, I suspect we're probably not. I mean, that's a decision you have to make in your own head. I mean, that's the bottom line. You're 18 years of age. You understand why you're here. You know what you've done. We've given you an opportunity to talk about what you've done. We've given you an opportunity to give us a reason why you did what you did. And you've continued on this crazy-ass story that, that this you have nothing to do with this, and that story is not believable. We don't it doesn't believe have it. to be believable. It will be proven. So the story that investigators are referencing here is Isabella's delusion that she is a 15-year-old girl from Ohio named Samantha Gonzalez who has run away from home because of her mother's abuse, and that all she wants to do is meet up with her boyfriend, and that this is just a crazy case of mistaken identity. And to investigators, this is just a story, a bad series of lies. But to Isabella, this is reality. Her delusion is so real that she doesn't even recognize photos of herself. I am not this Isabella girl. All this crazy fucking shit keeps happening, and I am not this girl. Crazy fucking shit, that's a good way to put it. How would you feel if this was done to you? I'd be scared if I were you. I'm not really scared. I'm just a little freaked out. So you're not scared by this? No, because the DNA will not match. Do you have no remorse for what you did? I did not do anything wrong. So you don't, do you? I am not. You can just sit sit there and continue to deny this with a clear Mm -hmm. conscience? I am not, Isabella. Really? You can just sit here and, and completely deny all of this? I'm not denying anything. I am being truthful. That's you. No, it is there's not. No, there's no question. That's you. <clears throat> She's pretty. Yeah, you're a pretty girl. That's you. That's not me. Yeah, it is. Slap your face, please. Yeah. Through the entire interrogation, she denies stabbing her mother, Yoon Mi. She denies being Isabella. And she denies that her father, who is brought into the station to identify her, is actually her father. Who's that? That's my baby. Okay. Sir, do you recognize? Do you recognize this? Which one? Come on back out here, second. Do you recognize her? Yeah, she's my daughter. What's her What's her name? Isabella. Isabella. What's her last name? Guzman. Isabella Guzman. Okay. 
Uh, right. This photograph here, is that photograph, is that your daughter there? Yeah. Okay. And this is your daughter here? Yeah. And so her interrogation ends with her being placed in handcuffs and taken to the Arapahoe County Jail where she awaited being formally charged. And in the meantime, like we saw earlier, her stepfather is brought in for questioning to try to make sense of the violence that had happened the night before. He explained a little bit about their family history and how Isabella was sent to live with her father at an early age because of her behavior and how things in the home had gotten especially bad in the days leading up to the murder. But Ryan said that he just had no idea that Isabella was capable of doing something like this. We were in the house again. Any together? No, no problems. No problems. No any conversation. Any? Not much of a conversation at all. We didn't. Did she give you any much. indications that she might be plotting to do something like this? Oh no! I knew she was mad at her mom, mm -hmm. and I knew she was very, very upset at her mom. But I had, I had no idea she would ever do anything like this. He told investigators about that email that Isabella had sent to her mother, saying, "You will pay," and how you and me was very afraid of her daughter at this point. But my wife was just on pins and needles because of all that had happened around Isabella the last couple of days. Okay. So has it seemed like things have gotten worse in the last few days between Isabella and her mom? With what you me told me, yes. With what she told me, yes. And that's what she worse. told you was the, the, the statement she had made? The cursing at her and... Uh, spitting in her face okay. and uh, the email she wrote to my wife that ended up in my wife's hands said something about you will pay or you've been cursed okay and your wife found that email today today at about uh, I remember she showed it to me uh, it came in I think about 242 something like that okay. before the officer showed up and it was from Isabella from Isabella but she marked it to a Cecilia it was kind of funny. She sent it to my wife, but she made it out to uh, Cecilia. Now, I mentioned earlier that this email was addressed to Cecilia, and we just heard Ryan, again, say the name Cecilia. So who is Cecilia? Well, it turns out that the reason Isabella killed her mom, or the reason she says she killed her mom, was because she thought she was actually a woman named Cecilia, and that in order to save the world— Cecilia needed to die. So all of this is part of her delusion. And delusion or not, she was responsible for Yoon Mi's murder. And so on August 30th, a judge ordered Isabella to remain in the Arapahoe County Jail without bond on charges of first-degree murder. And that afternoon, after refusing to leave her jail cell and basically being dragged into the courtroom, Isabella could be seen making these bizarre faces at the camera. And at one point, even staring deeply into a camera and making a pointing gesture towards each of her eyes. And it was all of this that just so happened to be caught on camera that made this case go pretty viral. Just into seven news, formal murder charges and crime of violence against this woman, Isabella Guzman. She's accused of stabbing her mother 79 times. Seven News reporter Lance Hernandez is live now. Lance, the filing of charges was actually delayed today because Guzman wouldn't leave her cell. Mike, she was due in court this morning, but Court officials told us she didn't want to leave her jail cell at the Arapahoe County Detention Center. Isabella Guzman now facing first-degree murder charges. She was uh, charged with first-degree murder after stabbing her mom about 79 times in the face and neck at this house in Aurora. The 18-year-old smirked at the camera as she stood up and walked to the defense table this afternoon, her arms and legs shackled. After the judge read the complaint against her, she looked over, stared at the camera, and motioned to the area under each of her eyes with her index finger. In 2020, right around the time that TikTok started to really get popular, the footage was posted to TikTok and went absolutely viral. Comments started to flood in, talking about how pretty she is with the song Sweet But a Psycho playing in the background. And I mean, people were praising her for her beauty and completely overlooking and making light of the fact that she killed her mom. And the comments that people were leaving were just disgusting. Things like, well, what can I say? Well done. I've fallen in love with her. I would fix her. She killed her own mother, but she is kind of cute. And that's just a few of the comments I saw after reading for like a minute. I guess I shouldn't be surprised by things like that. I mean, I've been on the internet and in true crime for long enough. Honestly, it really worries me for society. I mean, her mother was brutally, 
brutally killed. Yet people found it okay to imitate her facial expressions and comment about her looks. And yeah, I just... I don't know. I don't even have words for it. But anyway, moving on. After the charges were formally brought against her, Isabella sat in jail without bond until June of 2014. And it was only then that the truth about her schizophrenia was revealed to the public. During this hearing, Isabella entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. And she was backed up by a doctor who testified to her condition. This doctor testified that in the weeks and months leading up to the murder, Isabella began experiencing delusions and illusions that she just could not control. They explained that Isabella truly believed that her mother was a woman named Cecilia and that in order to save the world, she had to kill her. And that wasn't her only delusion. Her boyfriend, who was really an ex-boyfriend by the time the murder happened, explained that she also was saying things to him that just didn't make sense. And with what they learned about her having schizophrenia, it seemed possible that she was experiencing a different reality with him as well. And ultimately, it was clear to everyone, including the district attorney, that Isabella was not well and that she hadn't been well, mentally speaking, at the time of the murder. So her plea of not guilty by reason of insanity went uncontested. This afternoon, a state doctor told the court that Guzman, pardon me, uh, suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, that she hallucinates, stares into space, and has conversations with people who aren't there. The district attorney says he asked the court to find her not guilty by reason of insanity to avoid a trial as these state doctors determine that she's no longer a risk, a threat to herself or to the community. It could be a year, two years, it could be the remainder of her life. Now, George Brockler told me that it won't be an easy process. He says it wasn't an easy decision. He says down the road, once she's treated at the hospital in Pueblo, she'll have to come back to court so that the judge can see the process that she's making. And again, he said it's for an indeterminate period of time. It could be for the rest of her life. It could be a year or two before she's back out in public. And with that, the judge sentenced Isabella Guzman to an indefinite stay at the Colorado Mental Health Institute in Pueblo, Colorado. And her release would be granted if and when she was deemed no longer a threat to herself or society. And to the surprise of many, after only seven years, Isabella began her petition for release. In November of 2020, Isabella spoke out for the first time about what happened and what she said about what happened and why it happened might shock you. In the interview where she first spoke out, Isabel shared that she was the victim of abuse growing up. She said that her parents, who raised her as a Jehovah's Witness, abused her and that the abuse only worsened when she turned 14 and decided to walk away from the religion. She went on to say how hard her mother's murder had been on her and that she was also injured that day and has scars on her hands to prove it. And basically what Isabella wanted people to know by giving this interview is that she wasn't herself when she did that and that she's since been restored to quote full health. Now I'm actually going to play a clip from the interview but keep in mind it's the only clip available and it has really loud annoying music in the background so I'm, I apologize for that but I think it's important to hear. I was not myself when I did that and I have since been restored to full health. I was abused at home by my family for many years. My parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, I left the religion when I was 14. And the abuse at home worsened after I quit. The fight with my mom was terrible. And um, I was injured in the process. I have the scars on my hands. Um, I don't know if you can see or not. I'm not mentally ill anymore. I'm not a danger to myself or others. If I could change it or if I could take it back, I would. Now, I know that you guys are going to have many mixed feelings about this case, and I really want to hear your opinions. Does this look like someone who's truly sorry for brutally murdering their mother? Do you think that in seven years she's been rehabilitated, so to speak, and is ready to rejoin society? Do you think that she's remorseful for what she did? Isabella also came out and said that while in treatment at the Colorado Mental Institute, she was a victim of sexual assault three times at the hand of someone who worked there. She said, quote, he asked me if I wanted to go in there and look through to get some clothing. So I did. The other patient left and he went in there and shut the door behind me. She said she filed a report with the hospital police in 2015 and wanted to press charges against her attacker. However, according to reporting by CBS, when the district attorney's office in Pueblo looked into this report, they claimed to have never received the case. Isabella also says that she met with the DA's office, but they told her that the way the report was written 
would make it really hard to press charges, so she is stuck with very little options. And according to that same CBS report, Isabella was advised to contact the ACLU or the American Civil Liberties Union, which she said she was going to do. And right now, the Colorado Department of Human Services has denied a request for information on all this, so I'm not sure we will get much more information on this for a while. But all of this aside, Isabella remained and remains to this day in an institution despite her petitions for freedom. As of 2021, Isabella has been granted permission to leave the institution for group and individual therapy, but her activity will be monitored with a GPS tracking device. Now, it doesn't appear to me that she will be granted full freedom anytime soon, and I'm curious to hear from you all if you think she should be. It has only been 10 years since Yoon Mi was brutally murdered by her own daughter, and while Isabella may be able to manage her schizophrenia now, should that make her a candidate for release? Do you feel that she's done the time and should be released? Do you think that she should spend the rest of her life or at least a longer period of time institutionalized or behind bars? But what is very clear here, no matter how you feel about Isabella, is the death of her mother, Yoon Mi Hoi, was so horrific, so tragic, so brutal, and that in all my years of doing this, it never gets easier to talk about something so just unimaginable. I cannot imagine how terrifying it would be to be murdered by the being that you created, that you birthed. It makes me emotional even thinking about it. And I just hope that whatever the outcome is for Isabella, that that decision is made with justice for you and me in mind. But I am very curious to see what all of you have to say. I'm sure there will be some interesting debates in the comments on this one. I feel like we all just need to take a deep breath after that one. That was a lot. Very intense. But before I go, I do want to remind you all that my new neck mech hoodie is available now for purchase for pre-order actually on my merch website, which is kendallray.shop. And all pre-orders are expected to start shipping on December 6th. And I am really excited about this one. I love the colors. I think it is going to be one of my favorites that we have ever done for neck mech. And as always, 100% of the proceeds from this collection are donated directly to National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So give back while treating yourself. And you know, the holidays are coming up. Maybe it's a good time to grab one for someone you love. It's a really good quality blue hoodie and has the Every Child Deserves a Safe Childhood logo on the front and the Neck Mech logo on the back, which we've never done that before. I really like that. And as of today, when I'm recording, it's November 2nd, and we have officially raised $236,840 for Neck Mech. So thank you all for your support with that. And that is going to be it for me today, guys. I will be back next week, of course, to discuss another case. But until then, stay safe out there. <laughs>